Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And welcome to our worship this morning. It's lovely to see you all again today. Um, I've got one or two notices to start off with this morning. Um, for those of you who didn't have the opportunity to give last week, we will be doing a retiring collection for the Pakistan Food Appeal again today. And uh, if you'd like to place your donations in the basket at the back for that. Next week is our Harvest Festival. So as part of our Harvest Festival celebrations, we will be collecting food for the food bank. I know we collect regularly for the food bank, but for the harvest, we do tend to make a special effort to bring our gifts to go towards the food bank. And they are greatly needed at this time. So if you could think about that. Uh, they bring some tinned food, packet food, or bring your monetary offerings, and they will also go to the food bank so that they can buy the things that they need. Inside your notice sheet this morning, you should have found a little card to fill in with your information details if, if we need to contact somebody on your behalf at some time. It does still say Nelson Independent Methodist Church on the top of it, but it is for everybody to fill in. And if you filled one in before, if you could do another one, just so that we make sure we've got your updated details, and then just hand those to our Susan. Or Jean. A reminder that tonight, Sunday at 6, resumes its monthly meetings after its summer break. So if you'd like to come and join us for that, that will be, as it says, Sunday at 6, 6 o'clock. Uh, but that's in the church hall, because uh, of course our friends in the Romanian Christian Fellowship will be meeting here in church. So we'll be down in the church hall for that. But everybody is welcome to come and join in that perhaps less formal time of worship and celebration. And finally, just a reminder that Edna's funeral will take place here in church this coming Friday at 10.15 and then at 11.30 at Burnley Crown. And they are asking for donations in memory of Edna for Pendleside Hospice, should you wish to do that. I think there's really only one way to begin our service this morning, isn't there? And that is to mark the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. I think for the majority of us here today, we will know no other monarch. And it will seem very strange not to have her around. No doubt you will have read or heard many of the tributes that have been paid to her in the last few days. And they've come from such a wide variety of people, all ages, all nations, and they show how well loved and respected the Queen was. And they speak of her devotion to duty, her warmth, her sincerity, her sense of humour. Many have commented on the radiant smile that would light up any room that she entered. She was at ease and she put at ease many of people of all manner of backgrounds, from the youngest to the oldest, from ordinary people on the street to world leaders. And I think even those who perhaps are not fans of, of royalty or the system of monarchy, respected and admired her for the way that she carried out her duties, and she was steadfast in carrying out that pledge that she made at the age of 21. But above all, she was a person with a strong faith. And I believe it was that more than anything that carried her through that long reign <coughs> and all the ups and downs of her reign and her family life. And she was a great example of us, to us all of what it is to live out the Christian faith. But let's not forget that she was also a loving and a very much loved mother, grandmother and great grandmother. She will be greatly missed by all her family. And a family that has to grieve in the public eye, which is not easy for them. <coughs> and so today we give thanks for the life and example of Queen Elizabeth II. We remember her family at this time and the sorrow that they feel. And we pray for our new King Charles as he begins his reign. And I'm sure he will be the first to admit that he's got a hard act to follow. So if you are willing and unable, please stand for a moment as we remember our Queen.
Let's pray. Father God, this morning we come together to give thanks for our Queen Elizabeth. We thank you for her life and her reign. And above all, we thank you for the strong example of faith that she has given us. We pray in the assurance that she is now at peace with you after a long and devoted life of service to you and to this country. Father, we pray for the members of the royal family in these coming days, that they too might feel your presence amongst them, that they might be comforted by the knowledge that so many people loved and respected her. Father, help them through this difficult time as they grieve for a very much loved mother and grandmother and great-grandmother, because they also have to turn their thoughts to affairs of state and to the preparations for her funeral. Strengthen them, we pray, in these coming days, and all who will feel her loss. We pray too for our new King, Charles. We pray that you would uphold him and strengthen him as he begins to take over the reins of monarchy. Father, we ask that his faith in you might grow deeper and stronger in the days ahead, that he too might learn to look to you for wisdom and for guidance. And we pray for our nation, Lord, that we might support him and <coughs> encourage him, and Lord, that we might be together in the days ahead. And we ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Please be seated. So I'm going to hand over to our music group to open our worship this morning.
Thank you to the music group for leading us in our opening worship. Well, it's been quite a week this week, hasn't it? It's been quite a week for some of our young people as well, back to school. Emily really don't look too happy about that. <laughs> Have you had a good week at school? Has it been all right? You're now in year six, are you, Daniel? Wow, top of the school. Yeah. And uh, anybody started school for the first time this week? Oh, one or two people. Is it good? Yeah? Everything's gone all right? Yeah? Maybe a little bit nervous till we got settled in. Who's got new teachers? No, you've got new teachers as well, new classes, maybe some new subjects. Yeah? Maybe some exams to think about later on. <laughs> Maybe some of you older ones thinking about going back to university before much longer. Yeah? It's been one of those weeks, hasn't it? And of course there'll be lots of new teachers starting their jobs for the first time, won't there? We don't often think about teachers getting nervous, do we? Well, I think we do. Having to face all those little faces having to learn the new routines of school just in the same way so perhaps we need to remember to pray for our teachers as well that sometimes they get a bit nervous and a bit worried about what's going to go on and of course then we've got people starting new courses as well and we universities church and colleges as well so anything in particular that you young people would like us to pray for this morning Nothing that comes to mind in particular. Just that things carry on okay at school and life in general. And, yeah? Okay, let's pray with our young people then. Father God, as we come together this morning as your church family, we are so thankful and grateful for the younger members of that family who are here with us this morning and who meet with us week by week. Father, we want to pray a special blessing on them this morning as school and college and university starts again. We think particularly of those who have started school for the first time, those who have got new teachers, new classes, new subjects, those who are going to be looking ahead to thinking about important exams later in the year, whether that's at school or college or at university. We just pray for them all this morning, Father God, that you would help them to settle into their new routines, that you would help them to learn, above all, that you would help them to stay close to you and to remember that whatever happens, you are there to be with them and to guide them and take care of them. Father God, we pray for their teachers as well, that you would guide them that you would help them to know the right things to teach our young people and that you would help them to do that in such a way that they can understand. We pray for all teachers who are taking up new jobs at this time, particularly perhaps those who it's their first job and who are newly qualified and we know it can be a daunting task for them as well. So we pray for them that they would just feel comfortable and secure in their new roles. And Father, we pray that you would bless our young people this morning as they go down into the church hall to learn together. Bless their leaders, give them wisdom and patience as they work with and lead our young people into a closer relationship with you. And keep us all safe, Lord, we pray, and help us all to be listening this morning to what you have to say to us whether we're here or elsewhere in the building. Because we know that you want to talk to us this morning and help us to learn more about you and what it is to follow you. And Lord God, we know that that is not an easy thing to do, however old we are. And so we need your guidance and we pray for it this morning in your Holy Spirit. We thank you for Jesus and for all that he means to each one of us. And we pray that he will mean much more each day as we learn more about him and grow closer to him. And so we bring our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's join together as a family in our family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our day. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
we come to the part of our service where we're going to gather around the communion table and share communion together. So we're reminded of that time when Jesus and his disciples gathered together for that last meal. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go, just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup gave thanks and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus and his disciples shared that meal together. His disciples had no real idea of what was to come over the next few days. But Jesus did. And so he took the bread and wine and he used them as a way of telling them, although they probably still didn't really grasp it at that point. And maybe we're a bit like that this morning. We don't fully grasp what Jesus did for us when he died on that cross. And we don't fully understand all that he asks us as, as his followers. And that's all right. What matters is that we're trying to find out. That we're here to listen, to learn, maybe to ask questions. And so wherever you think you might be on your journey with Jesus this morning, however much you feel you do or don't understand, you are welcome to share in this bread and wine if you feel that that is right for you. Because Jesus died for you. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save all who believe in him and bring them to eternal life. And now we share the bread and wine as symbols of the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. And as a reminder of the sacrifice that he made so that we could mend our broken relationship with God caused by the things that we've done wrong that upset and hurt God. When we've done something wrong that we know has hurt someone else, we know that the right thing to do is to say sorry and to ask for forgiveness. And that's not always easy, is it? And it's not always easy to say sorry to God and ask him for his forgiveness, but it is something that we need to do. So we're just going to have a few moments of quiet, when we can each say our own prayer, we can tell God that we're sorry for the wrong things that we've done, and we can ask for his forgiveness. So let's just pause in quiet prayer. Father, hear our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now that we've done that, we can share the bread and wine with thankful and grateful hearts, as we know that God does forgive us if we are truly sorry. So would the communion service please like to come forward.
Jesus took the bread. He broke it and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. We <coughs> eat the bread as you receive it, being thankful that Jesus thought you were worth dying for.
be together, to be united, to share his good news. Let us drink and be thankful. So we pray. Father, we thank you this morning for reminding us of the price that Jesus paid for each one of us on that cross. May we never take that cost for granted. And through Jesus, we now offer ourselves as living sacrifices, equipped with the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. So we sing together our hymn, number 193.
Father, we thank you for the many gifts that you have given us. And as we've just been reminded of that extra special and precious gift of Jesus. But now, Father, it's our turn to give our gifts to you. Pray that we do so with willing and grateful hearts and generous hearts and minds. We pray that you will take these gifts, both of our money and of our time and of our talents, and you will use all to honour your name, to bring glory to you and to bring others into your kingdom. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. to our fellowship prayers and we've got quite a few people in need of our prayers particularly this morning of course first of all we think of Edna's family as they prepare for her funeral on Friday I'm pleased to report that Susan is home from hospital and we're hoping and praying that she stays home this time and doesn't end up going back again I'm still having problems with her leg her hips doing fine she says but it's the swelling in her leg that's causing the issues and I know she's got one or two hospital appointments this week to try and sort things out as well as to check on how her leg is doing. Graham's still waiting for his hospital appointment although he says the pain is a little bit easier but I could imagine that a little bit easier still means it's quite bad so we do need to continue to pray for Graham. And Helen Wallbank has been taken into hospital this week as well. So we need to remember to pray for Helen and also for Brian and for Gareth. And many of us here will uh, remember Jeff Lomas, our former Connectional President, and he used to do such a lot of work with the, the young people within the Connection. And we've prayed for Jeff previously because he's been far from well. Well, I'm sorry to report that Jeff died yesterday. So if we can remember Irene and Alison and Andy and all Jeff's family as we give thanks for all that he has done in God's service over the years, particularly within the connection, but elsewhere as well. Looking wider, I think we need to pray for our new Prime Minister. She's had quite a, an induction, hasn't she, this week, with one thing and another and her new government, and of course our new king. We need to remember ongoing situations around the world as well. Think of our brothers and sisters and other people in Pakistan as they continue to come to terms with the devastation and loss caused by those floods. And of course the war still continues in Ukraine and elsewhere. And there are many people in our own country who are in serious need at this time. So, shall we pray together? Perhaps a moment of quiet, just to bring your own particular prayers before God and the people and situations that are on your heart. Father God, we thank you this morning that you have given us the privilege and the power of prayer. We thank you that we can come to you just as we are and we can bring to you all the things that gladden our hearts, but also all the things that sadden us and weigh us down. But Father, we know that we don't have to come with any fancy words or set formulas, we can just come and talk to you as our Father. And we do that this morning as we bring before you all these people and situations that we have talked about. We think particularly this morning of Edna's family as they prepare for her funeral next Friday and we pray, Lord, that you would give them a peace and a sense of comfort. And for all those who mourn, Lord, known to us and not known to us, we think again of our royal family at this time and pray for comfort for them. Father, we think too of Irene and Andy and 
Alison and the wider family as they mourn the passing of Jeff yesterday. We thank you for him and for all that he has done over the years to serve you so faithfully. And particularly the work that he did for so many years amongst the young people within our connection and how he helped many of them to come to faith and to a deeper faith. And we rejoice, Lord, that he is now with you and that you have said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. We think of those members of our fellowship who are not too well at this time and who just need that special touch for you. We give thanks that Susan is home, but we know she's still not back to full health and strength. So we pray that you will continue to be with her. We pray that also for Anne and for Graham at this time. Strengthen them, Lord. Help them through their recovery. And we pray too for the doctors and nurses who are caring for them, that they'll find the cause of the problems and therefore be able to treat them properly. We pray too for Helen, Lord, who's been taken into hospital this week. And again, we pray that she would receive the right treatment that she needs. And that you'd also be with Gareth and with Brian at this worrying time. Father, we would pray for ourselves. We know, Lord, that we don't always get things right and we know that sometimes we are not the followers of, of you that we would want to be, that we desire to be. But we know, Lord, that you are there beside us and if we turn to you, that you will strengthen us and help us. You'll pick us up when we fall. You'll dust us down when we make mistakes and you'll help us to carry on. And so we pray that in the week ahead, you would do just that for each one of us, whatever comes our way. Help us to keep our eyes focused upon you and listening for your voice. As we think of our nation at this time, we pray for those who feel uncertain about the future, perhaps because of their own personal circumstances, not knowing how they're going to pay their bills or what lies ahead in various ways. And with that in mind, we would pray for our new Prime Minister and Government, that you would give them wisdom at this time to know what is the best thing to do. Lord, sometimes when we look at these problems, they seem so huge and overwhelming, and we just wonder if anybody can do anything. And that's where we need your wisdom, where we need your guidance. And so we pray that your hand would be upon our government at this time and upon the leaders of all nations throughout the world. And we think particularly of those parts of the world where there is serious difficulty at this time. We pray for the people in Pakistan. Lord, we can't begin to imagine what it is like to live in such circumstances where you have lost everything that you have, including perhaps members of your family. And again, Lord, we see those pictures on our news bulletins and in our newspapers, and we think, just what can we do? But Lord, we are thankful that there are people who can help, but we know that they need our support financially and prayerfully. And we offer both those this morning. Likewise for the people in Ukraine and throughout the world who are living with the threat, the very real threat of warfare. Again, perhaps hard for many of us to imagine who've never lived through that situation. And again, we just pray for your peace to fall upon those nations. For the people who are causing the wars to stop and think. And Father, for the people who are living through that, to somehow have comfort and strength. And so, Lord God, as we come together this morning, again, we thank you for being able to talk to you, being able to bring our prayers to you, knowing that you do listen, knowing that you do answer, but being aware that sometimes you don't answer in the way that we want or in the time schedule that we would like. 
And so help us to be listening and patient as we wait for those answers. And we bring these prayers in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we turn to God's word for this morning, we sing together the hymn number 506. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand hath made, then sings my soul, how great thou art.
Our reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and we're going to look at the first 16 verses of chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, page 1175 if you're following in the Bible. This is what Paul had to say to the church at Ephesus. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean <coughs> except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. <coughs> the church at Ephesus was one of the most prominent of those established by Paul during his missionary journeys. He spent over three years with them, and as a result, he grew very close to them. And unlike many of his other letters to the churches, this one was not written to confront a heresy or a problem within the church, but to strengthen it and to encourage it. And we all need strength and encouragement, don't we? Living as Christians is, is not easy. And let's be honest, living with other Christians is not always easy either, is it? And so, in this particular passage, Paul focuses on three areas that would help not only the Ephesians back in that first century, but also to help us here in Cornerstone Church in the 21st century. And the three areas that Paul focuses on are unity, using your gifts, and speaking the truth in love. So let's see what he has to say. Paul begins this section of his letter with a reminder that God has chosen us to be his representatives on earth. We have that awesome privilege of being called Christ's very own. But with that privilege comes responsibility. A responsibility to live lives worthy of the calling we have received. Because people are watching you and I as we go about our daily lives. And they're watching to see if we match up as it were. If our actions and our attitudes fit with our words. That's a big responsibility, isn't it? 
As I said, one that perhaps most of us don't find easy. Especially when you look at what Paul says and how he says we should live that life worthy of our calling. In verse 2 he says this, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. It's quite a tall order, isn't it? And at this point he's actually talking about how we live with one another as members of the church community. Never mind how we present ourselves to the people outside the church. And after all, the church is a group of fallen human beings who have to learn to get on with one another. And I'm sure we can all cite examples of when that hasn't happened. And it was something that the Israelites in the Old Testament found really difficult, as they learnt what it was to be God's chosen people. And church history is littered with examples of how Christians have not managed any better. Maybe some of us this morning have personal experience of contention within the Christian community. So Paul offers us some fundamentals of unity. There is one body, he says in verse 6, which implies that we should be concentrating on what unites us rather than maybe what might divide us. And as Paul continues, not only is there one body, but one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all. To build in unity is one of the Holy Spirit's most important roles. He leads but we have to be willing to be led and to do our part. And we do that by focusing on God and not on ourselves. All believers are united under Christ himself and God is active in the world and in the lives of believers. And Paul also reminds us of the foundation stones that will make our unity possible. Back to verse two again. Being completely humble. Now that doesn't be, mean being a doormat for others or pretending that we're no good or we don't have anything to offer. It means not thinking that we are better than those around us. And that gentleness that Paul speaks of is a, a controlled strength that always asks, what can I do to promote unity and build one another's faith? The next thing that Paul mentions is patience. Now that's something that many of us struggle with, isn't it? Me included. I am not the most patient of people. And we do live in a very impatient society, don't we? Where we want everything now, everything instant. Instant results, instant food, instant coffee, instant this, that and the other. Instant communication. Oh, how we mourn if our internet goes slow. You know, sometimes we like that as Christians, aren't we? We want God's answers to our prayers right now. We want God's kingdom to come in all its fullness right now. We're not prepared to wait. But God's not in such a big hurry. He is patiently working in and alongside us, refashioning us into the image of his son. And as he does so, he invites us to partner with him in the coming of his kingdom. So what we need to ask ourselves is, what does it mean to be part of God's plan in this place and in this time? We're all commanded to proclaim the good news to the world around us and we each need to find out what that means for us in our daily lives. And also, how might we encourage each other to grow and to fulfill the wonderful plan that God has for us? And if we're going to do the latter, we certainly will need to bear with one another, won't we? Or have understanding. And that will involve accepting the people around us just as they are, without judging them, or without making them conform to our way of expressing their spirituality or of doing things. 
You see, our oneness in Christ doesn't destroy our individuality. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. No one is ever going to be perfect here on earth. And so we are going to have to love and accept each other in spite of our faults. And other people are going to have to do the same with us. And Paul reminds us that we're going to need to do all that in love. That is, treating one another as God has treated us with grace and with mercy. Paul then goes on to spell out how everyone called by Christ has a role in building the body of Christ on earth. The important link to notice is that everyone receives grace and so everyone displays an outworking of that grace. In other words, every Christian is given special gifts by the Holy Spirit for the building up of the church. And Paul mentions some of them in verse 11. And in other letters, he, he lists the gifts. Here in particular in Ephesians, he mentions apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists and teachers, but you can find numerous others in his other letters. But notice what Paul says. People are not given the gifts to fulfill their roles for their own benefit but to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. It's not a case of some people being there to do all the work for the rest, but to train other people to do the work themselves. Everyone equips everyone else as we use those gifts. It's about both speaking and doing. Making a community where everyone gets a chance to flourish and to grow. And this happens as people are active in ministry as well as in being recipients of ministry. And it does need everyone to play their part. I don't know how you feel about uh, this idea of finding and, and using your gifts. And maybe this extract from this, this book that I've got perhaps rings true with you. So have you ever caught yourself, perhaps in the middle of a church service, thinking that you're nothing more than a useless blob? <laughs> if the answer is yes, join the club. There are quite a few of us. It usually happens when some multi-talented super-Christian is sharing their gripping testimony before singing a track from their latest album and then launching into a detailed exposition of Badger Skins in the Temple from Leviticus. Because you see, sometimes, without meaning to, gifted Christians can make us feel very useless. And if we're not careful, it doesn't take much for that to become a negative, faith-destroying force in our lives. It gives rise to jealousy and cuts us off from the flow of God's blessing. I believe it is a subtle part of Satan's strategy. He loves to make Christians feel useless, doubt God's power, and get eaten away by tensions towards other believers. The truth, which the devil cannot stand, is that God can actually use you. More than that, God wants to use you, yes, you, that complex bundle of flesh and fear with all your doubts and questions. Because with Jesus Christ, you are unstoppable. So, how do we find our gifts? Well, the simple answer is that we ask God. Several times in his teaching, Jesus encouraged his followers to ask God for things. And there are a few simple guidelines that we can follow. And the first is to be open to what God has for you. Don't put conditions on him by listing the gifts that you will or will not accept or the things that you are or are not, are not prepared to do. Second, be ready. Ready to search the scriptures. Take a deep look into your Bible and see what general principles you can find. 
but also what God is saying to you specifically. Third, be willing to spend time with God, seeking him. Many of us have discovered, haven't we, that answers rarely come instantly or are all tied up neatly. It's generally a slow and steady revelation and it requires patience and persistence to unravel. Fourth, be available to God so that he can use you at any time. And finally, be teachable. We're all human. We all get it wrong sometimes. But the important thing is to learn from our mistakes, especially when it involves being corrected by others, which is probably the hardest thing for us to accept. But if we manage to do all of those, then we will have the right sort of attitude to go forward with God and to be used by him. What do we do once we've discovered our gifts? Well, the next bit is to discover where God wants us to use them. And I think we've got a fair idea on that one already, haven't we? But just in case you need a reminder, we use our gifts so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So once we've discovered our gift or our gifts, we need to find the right place within the body of Christ to exercise them. And again, that will be first and foremost, seeking God in prayer and reading his word. But it might also mean seeking the wise counsel of a trusted Christian friend or of someone in church leadership. And after all, as Paul again reminds us, the main job of the leadership is to encourage and equip others in God's service not to do it all themselves. Now it may be obvious to you that you are already using your gifts in the role that God wants you to. Praise God for that. Keep on at it. Keep seeking to develop that gift even further. I remember more years ago than I care to when I took my driving test. When I passed, my driving instructor said to me this, now go and learn to drive. I've taught you to pass a test, but you now need to learn by experience. You need to develop your skills. And it's the same with us, with our gifts, with God. But it may be equally obvious that God has got something new for you to do, maybe something that you've never in your wildest moments thought about doing. I'll take your courage in both hands and go for it. But don't be afraid to ask for help and support along the way from God himself and for other members of the fellowship. It may be some time before you get any idea of what you should be doing. In that case, persevere. It will come eventually. Keep praying. Ask others to pray on your behalf. Ultimately, our goal as individuals and as the corporate body of God's people here in this church is that each one of us should discover and use our spiritual gifts in the way that God wants us to, to build up this church so that then we are ready to go out into the world and to fulfil our commission of making disciples. And remember that all this is done together. We use our gifts to build up the church in unity. It's not a competition. Look at what Paul says in verse 13 of our reading. As the body of Christ, we can accomplish more together than we ever could working by ourselves. Working together, the church can express the fullness of Christ. We grow up, we become mature in our faith. And that makes us more able to withstand the people and the things that would seek to draw us away from Christ. Things like false teaching, as Paul describes it, the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. See, a united church is a strong church. 
And that brings Paul to his third point, speaking the truth in love. Because he says it's by this process that we will grow up as Christians and as a church. But what does he mean? Speaking the truth in love. Well, the one thing it doesn't mean, as sometimes it sadly has been used, is a chance for us to tell other people exactly what we think of them. Maybe you know the sort of thing I mean. Someone says to someone else, I want to tell you this. Now I'm speaking in love because I think you need to hear it. And they then go on to say perhaps some of the most devastating words and leave the recipient really. Maybe you've been on the receiving end of that sort of thing, that truth spoken in love. It's very hurtful, isn't it? And I know people, very sadly, who've turned their backs not only on the church, but also on God because of that. That's not what Paul's talking about. To speak the truth in love is to offer hope and life through the good news of Jesus. If we speak the truth in love within the framework of what Paul's outlined for us in the first six verses of this passage, then we are speaking the truth about Jesus to build on the soul in faith and in grace. Christ is the truth. And the Holy Spirit who guides the church is the spirit of truth. And as followers of Christ, we must be committed to that truth. That means that our words should be honest and our actions should reflect Christ's integrity. And we do all this in love. As members of the one body, we can affirm the gifts of others, even gifts that they may already be skilled in using, so that they can build up in truth, hope and life. So if you remember at the beginning, I said that Paul wrote this letter to encourage the Ephesians. And we can do the same to each other. And if an individual within the church does stumble, well, the rest of the fellowship is there to pick them up and to help them to walk with Christ again. The parts of the body help each other in the growing process. You know, maturity and unity are impossible without love. Mm -hmm. As we look back, we can give thanks for the many blessings that we have received when we were two churches. But now we look forward, knowing that God has more blessings in his plan for us as one church. The question this morning for each one of us is, are we prepared to come with open hearts and minds to ask God what he wants us to do in the building up of this particular body of Christ? In the coming months. For some that might mean more of the same. For others it might mean a radical change. For some it could mean taking a step back and encouraging others to use their gifts more. For others it might mean stepping out of the shadows and playing more of a role. But whatever it is, the important thing is that we do what God wants us to do. Paul writes in Romans chapter 12 verse 1, Therefore I urge you brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Are you prepared to be that living sacrifice? As one Christian graffiti artist so eloquently put it, the only trouble with a living sacrifice is that it keeps crawling off the altar. Yes, we will make mistakes. We will get it wrong at times. But as long as we learn from those mistakes, God will continue to use us. I want to finish by playing you a song that came to mind as I was preparing this message. And it's called Living Sacrifice, so you can see the link with what Paul has just said to us. And it also links back to the words of our prayer at the end of communion, where we prayed that God would send us out as living sacrifices. And if you were listening, it was, those words were also mentioned in the video that James played to us last week as part of his message. So I think maybe God is trying to tell us something, isn't he? 
Les is going to put the words on the screen as, as the song plays. And, but perhaps you might like to just close your eyes and, and listen to the words rather than, than read them and concentrate on them. And maybe offer them to God as your own prayer this morning, stating your desire to move on with him. So let's listen to the song, Living Sacrifice.
So what we've been learning this morning then, folks, have you got something to share with us? It's like Daniel's the spokesperson again this morning. <laughs> Overseas to get your job, doesn't it, Daniel?